And I always remember the first ever client that I saw during my training. I was all really prepared. I'd done all my homework. I thought, right, I prepared for everything. What I hadn't prepared for was the fact that this person came in and said, thank you, Rick, for seeing me. Before we start, I just need to tell you I'm a counselor. And I thought, no. Uh, so it's the idea of having um, a professional counselor who was my first client. And so, of course, that made me very anxious. So I had to say, well, you know, that makes me really anxious, but I'm going to do the best job I can. And it was a, it was a, good, it was a good piece of work. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Authorize by Amazing Workplaces. As the name suggests, Authorize, the show, is all about authors and books. In today's session of Authorize, we are going to speak to Rick Hughes, author of the book, Get Alive creating a successful work-life balance. Rick started his career with a business degree and entered the world of advertising agencies. But he soon moved out of advertising and retrained as a counselor and coach. Since 25 years, Rick has been a lead advisor for the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy and laterally head of counseling at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Rick co-edited a book on employee well-being support. He later worked as lead author for the crisis book, Overcoming and Surviving Work-Life Challenges and the Well-Being Workout, How to Manage Stress and Develop Resilience. Rick runs Rick Hughes Well-Being Services, offering coaching, mentoring, and counseling to individuals and organizations. Today, Rick joins us from Alfred, Scotland to talk about his first book as sole author, Get Alive, a successful work-life balance, which was published in March, 2020, just three weeks before the UK pandemic lockdown, and how he has just resigned from his job at the University of Aberdeen to have a better, work-life balance. So let us talk to Rick and know a little more about his journey from advertising to counseling and psychotherapy and his book, Get Alive. Welcome, Rick, to Authorize, the show about authors by Amazing Workplaces. Thank you, Eka, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be uh, joining you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. The pleasure is entirely ours to have you today on the show. And uh, I'm really looking forward to discussing your book and your journey with you. Yep, great. And uh, I'm hoping to share what I've learned over the years as well. So um, um, thank you again for this opportunity. Okay, so let's start our discussion today. So Rick, after earning your degree in business, you were excited to enter the world of advertising agencies, but very soon you left it for good. So what drew you to the world of advertising and what pushed you out of it? I'm really curious to know, you know about your journey. Yeah, I, I think that's a good, good question. Um, I, I took a degree in business because when I left school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, and business seemed to be a degree that could open a lot of different doors. Uh, and I still am really grateful I did that degree and I've benefited from it since then. Um, but it was in the, the sort of the mid nineties. So it was the era of um, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. So quite what you could call quite extreme capitalism. And the focus of her government was very much about markets, business, the economy. And I suppose I got swept up in that uh, with the business degree. And I, marketing was one of the subjects that was in, in my business degree. And I was really interested in that. And advertising for me was the pinnacle of that. It was a really creative focus. Um, and I really wanted to get into that area. So I did join an advertising agency after I finished my degree. Uh, it was a great, great agency in, in Edinburgh, in Scotland. Um, and I was there probably for about three, four years, I think. Um, and I worked on the media side and the creative side as well. Um, and initially, I loved it. I thought this is really creative. It's about being clever, 
thinking about a product or a service, how to sell it to somebody so that they would buy it. And that's the gist of it. But I think after a bit, I realized it's all about money. It's about products and services. But I felt while people were treated more as consumers and commodities, I started to feel that people were being left out as people. They were just purchasers at the end of the day. And I think for me, there was something about realizing that it was important for me to be involved in something that was more people focused as opposed to being product or service focused. And even when I was working in advertising, I took an evening course on counseling skills just to see if that was something I would be interested in. And I found I absolutely loved it. And I thought, I can see this as being a way forward. So even though I'd had five years of a degree, three or four years of a career, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to start again. I'm going to go back to college, go back to university. I trained as a counsellor initially in Georgia, USA, and then also in um, Glasgow in Scotland. And I got my counselling diploma. And then that really just started my career. So after my evening course, I decided, right, I'm going to leave. And that's when I went back into education again and started again. And while people were saying at the time, right, you were really good in advertising, you know, you could have had a great career. And it's like, great, well, a career is not for life anymore. Sometimes we change careers and we need that as we discover parts of ourselves. Um, so for me, it was the right thing for me. I still have a great deal of respect for people in advertising and marketing. Uh, I think they do a great job, obviously. Uh, but for me, I needed to do something that was much more people focused. And, and I haven't looked back. Uh, great, Rick. Uh, interesting to know about your journey. And uh, you know, uh, when I saw your profile and mentioned about you know, a journey from advertising to counseling, I was just thinking how exactly you know, it happened. Thanks for sharing this, uh, the details of your journey with us. So, uh, Tell me, Rick, uh, you mentioned that you are people focused and not product focused. Yeah. So, what role does a straight play in you choosing to become a counselor and coach? And in fact, uh, how did it shape your entire career, you know, after advertising? I think I think first of all, yeah, to do this role, you have to you have to like people, you have to be really interested in people. Um and I think the role of counselor, coach, mentor, um, you have to be empathic. So you have to understand what's going on from somebody else's point of view. You have to be able to walk in their shoes. Um, but you've also got to be congruent. You've got to be open and honest and also very non-judgmental. So you have to understand in your own mind where perhaps your prejudices might lie and to fight those and to get rid of them. So... I've worked for thousands of individuals and organizations over the last 25 years um, from almost every type of religion, uh, culture, race, uh, gender, ethnicity. And it's about respecting and appreciating this diversity so that you do provide this inclusive approach for your work with people. Um, and I think it's about just generally being interested in people and having the honor and the privilege of getting to know their lives, getting to know their struggles, um, hopefully building up the trust in a therapeutic relationship where they're, they're open enough to trust you. And I think once a relationship is there, you work closely together to understand either what the problem is or how they want to improve something in their lives. And it's really trying to understand from their point of view what's going on for them, why they're stuck, what their challenges are, but also what their hopes and aspirations are, and working with them as, a, as an ally to accompany them on a journey to achieve what they want. So it's either to re resolve the problem or to meet that aspiration that they're trying to achieve in their lives. So it, it is very much about really enjoying the diversity of people that you work with but also the uniqueness. So even though I've worked with thousands of people, every single person has been unique in their own way. And it's about appreciating and enjoying that individuality and that uniqueness. And, and actually the same is true with organizations. I mean, I've worked 
with a lot of different organizations. Uh, recently, I was working with the UK government department. I've also worked with um, a different university. I've worked with a police force. They all have different issues, uh, different cultures within the organizations. But with something like the Get a Life book, um, I've seen a lot of commonalities. A lot of people do share similar struggles. But again, it's the uniqueness of the individual that I've enjoyed about that people focus, as you say. Yeah, very true. Uh, so uh, how did you discover that uh, it is people you want to work with? I mean, uh, before taking up that course, uh, you know, just after you know your advertising stint, how did you discover that this is something you really want to do? So how did you discover that affinity with people and that interest that, yes, I want to work with people? Yeah, well, I think during my training, um, we did have placements in various agencies and therapy practices. So, so that gave us kind of real people, real scenarios um, to, in a sense, test how we could get on and apply our training. Um, and I always remember the first ever client that I saw during my training, I was all really prepared. I'd done all my homework. I thought, right, I prepared for everything. What I hadn't prepared for was the fact that this person came in and said, thank you, Rick, for seeing me. Before we start, I just need to tell you I'm a counsellor. And I thought, no. Uh, so it's the idea of having um, a professional counsellor who was my first client. And so, of course, that made me very anxious. So I had to say, well, you know, that makes me really anxious, but I'm going to do the best job I can. And it was a, it was a good, it was a good piece of work. But even through that, I think I was working in a, in a medical practice in uh, quite a tough area of Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and even working with that community, it was a great privilege to see the different challenges and struggles that they um, presented. So I think the more I got into it, the more I saw diversity of the, the issues that people would come to counselling or coaching for. And the more I got, the more interest I, I became in it and wanted to develop and evolve and branch out. So. I focused mainly in the workplace setting, but with my recent job, I was obviously working at a, a large university. Uh, I think there was something like 130 nationalities at the University of um, Aberdeen. It's, it's what they call an ancient university. It's over 500 years old, so a lot of culture and history. Um, so working in the education sector was interesting, but I've also worked in primary care and GP practices as well. So I think different sectors provide different insights. But again, we all we all struggle with similar things. So I think the more the more I got onto it, the more um, I enjoyed what I was doing. And I knew that what I was doing was the right thing to do. Absolutely. And you know, at the core, people are the same. So our struggles would always be, you know, somebody else would be mirroring the similar kind of, you know, uh, traits and struggles in life. Interesting. So uh, tell me, Rick, uh, you have uh, assisted in editing a book and writing and co-authoring two books uh, before becoming an independent author. And all these four books are about wellness challenges resulting from workplace stress anxiety and lack of balance between one's personal and professional life. So what makes you so passionate about this subject? You can you know, just throw a little more light on what makes you so passionate about this subject. Yeah, I think wellness has really raised itself up in the corporate agenda, certainly since the, um, the pandemic hit us. Um, but so has work-life balance. Um, and obviously, a lot of us have been working from home and we've had this sort of hybrid working system, which might be the future for us. Um, but I think the general concept of wellness has, has increased in organizations over the last few years because it's, it's now recognized as being a really important um, element that allows organizations to function effectively. Um, in the UK, it's in legislation that all organizations have a duty of care to provide a safe and stress-free and healthy working environment. And I think organizations know that if they have a happy and healthy workforce, they're going to be a lot more productive than if they're not. And 
even though I've been working in this field for 25 years, I'm still amazed that we're still talking about stress and resilience. And I remember talking about that 25 years ago. Um, and it's not that we haven't learned, but I think um, the corporate world is, is obviously very occupied with the product, the service, the business, the market. Um, and they sometimes lose sight of the fact that employees are human beings. And I think the new focus on work-life balance is recognizing that actually people have a life. That's why I call the book Get a Life, because we all have a life beyond work. But we can struggle to balance that. And I think that's been the big challenge over the last um, last year. And as you say, I, I launched my book um, in 3rd of March 2020. And with books, you have a production cycle that's about 18 months. So you don't plan when it's going to launch. That was it. And of course, I thought, uh, great, it launched. And yes, we had our lockdown in the UK on the 23rd of March. And I thought this is an absolute disaster. I had a number of book launches that were lined up. They all got cancelled. And I thought, after all this effort, what a disaster. But we've been talking about nothing else apart from work-life balance over the last year. And it's so ironic that I've become a slightly guilty beneficiary of the pandemic because we're, this is a really important topic for us all now. Um, and I've been asked to speak at so many organizations, conferences uh, on this topic. So um, no, well-being is very much up on the agenda. And I think as we go beyond getting through this pandemic, it, it probably will stay up there. I think organizations realize that we need to treat people as people more. Okay, so um, like you uh, mentioned about, you know, uh, your book being released in this uh, pandemic, and uh, incidentally, although you were quite uh, stressed, you know, something like a lockdown had happened immediately after the launch, still you benefited from it. So um, Rick, tell me one thing, uh, do you uh, see actually work-life balance getting, uh, getting tackled in the corporates and workplaces? Or do you think that we'll just keep on, you know, just struggling to tackle it and we'll keep on, you know, uh, going round and round talking about it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I think the majority of organizations will realize that people have had a long enough experience of a more hybrid, flexible working routine. And I think it'll be people who will demand um, that organizations take that on board in the future more. Um, I think one organization, Goldman Sachs, were recently reported as saying that they want everybody back in the office and they want them doing 80 hour weeks. Um, but that got a lot of media coverage because a lot of employees were saying, no, we don't accept that anymore. We, we want to change that culture. Um, you've got a lot of other organizations now who are preparing for a hybrid work. So you can work from home some days, you can go into the office other days because they realize that both are really important. Clearly, some organizations, you're not going to have that opportunity. So in the medical profession, for instance, you, you may need to, you, you still have to have hospitals, you still have to have police forces out there, you need public services. So some organizations and some roles are not going to find that hybrid. But while, the, while for some people they won't be able to work from home, I think they'll still be able to have more of a balance so that they can maybe change the shift. I was reading about one organization in the construction industry who were deciding that rather than having the normal eight to five working hours, they were going to measure performance based on output. So individual teams had different construction um, jobs to do. And it was up to them when they chose to do that. So if there were a number in that team who had childcare responsibility, wanted to drop their kids off, early or they wanted to pick the kids up from school, then they could start early and work as a team to do that so that they could accommodate what the majority of the team wanted. So I thought that was a creative way that we've started to learn from how we've developed over the pandemic. And, and I think organizations are going to be a bit more creative. I think they are going to listen to employees because people are going to want this. Not everybody's going to want to go back to work. 
a lot of people definitely want to get back into the office. They're sick of working at home, um, but, you know, that's fine. Uh, some people, you know, we all have different needs and wants, and, and it's important that everybody's listened to. But, uh, yeah, I think in answer to your question, I think wellness and particularly work-life balance will remain a hot topic for organizations. I think that will happen. Right. So basically, you know, I asked this question because uh, you mentioned that 25 years back also you were, uh, you know, tackling with this and even after 25 years, it's still something, you know, which is uh, everybody is talking about and everybody is going through. And especially yeah. after the pandemic, it's become even more pro prominent as a subject that people are discussing, right? Okay. So, um, Rick, tell, uh, tell me one thing, one very interesting thing which I found in your uh, uh, summary of the book was the nine P's. So, in your book, Get Alive, you've spoken about the nine P's that can make up the theme of work-life balance. So, tell us something about this nine P's and your wheel of future concept and how do these help people deal with work-life balance? Yeah, okay. Um, well, the nine Ps uh, were what I managed to cluster um, 45 different variables that I believed that uh, contributed to work-life balance. So a lot of people think work-life balance is just about being at work and being at home, and that's it, two things. Um, but I did a lot, a lot of research and identified 45 different component parts, and I grouped them under the nine Ps. Uh, so basically, the nine Ps are personal. So these are issues in your life that are important to provide a bit of creativity and shift in your personal life. It's about having fun. It's, it's about having adventure in your life. It's what you do at weekends. It's what you do in the evenings. These are really important parts of your work-life balance. The second one was about people. Clearly, people are fundamental to our work-life balance. And this is about relationships at home, so our family, our relatives, our friends, but also actually our work relationships. And clearly we have to get on with people at work and we develop friendships at work as well. So people are really important in that uh, equation. Then I've got productivity and performance. So this is about your life at work. And this taps into how you work your working day. So productivity and performance is about working smarter and not necessarily longer. Um, in the USA, they have a really long hours working culture. Britain's not particularly good. Uh, I know that in India, for instance, uh, you don't tend to take your holidays uh, a lot. Um, so different cultures are different thing, but it's about working smarter and not longer. Then the next one I have is professional development. So this is really understanding why you do the job that you do. So I do the job that I do because it works for me, it fits me. Advertising didn't quite do it for me. So what is your purpose and meaning at work and how do you evolve and develop in your career? And also what stage you're at in your career? It might be that you decide that you put more hours in when you're younger so that you're trying to move up the ladder a bit. And then you can take your foot off a little bit when you're getting a bit older and you prioritize family, perhaps. So it's again, it's that balance. But that's about your professional development. Then there's the psychological and the physical. So this is about your health and well-being. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. But it's about your physical and your mental health. We all have physical health. We all have mental health. And it's about being attentive to that and monitoring our physical and our mental health and well-being. And then we have the practical and the physical. So it's what is your home life like, uh, your home environment? Does your home actually work for you as an environment? Is it conducive to a happy and healthy home environment? But it's also looking at um, your finances, um, making sure that you can balance your own income and expenditure so you don't get into debt and that creates more stress and reduces the other things that you can do in your life. So that's that's the, the last two, the final nine. But I was speaking to, uh, I was in conversation with a group of chief executives and business leaders last week, and somebody shouted out, Rick, you've forgotten one. 
Uh, prioritization, that's key to work-life balance. I do have prioritization, but it's very true. Prioritization is a big part of work-life balance. It's what you prioritize at different times. Um, so um, that pretty much summarizes the, uh, the, nine, the nine Ps. And the, the wheel of future is, I basically called it the wheel of future because it's a bit like the wheel of fortune, that, get, that TV game show in, in the sense it's a wheel that spins around and it stops somewhere. But I called it the wheel of future because ultimately being able to balance our work and our lives will contribute to the future that we will experience. So it's about managing the here and now so that you provide a better future for yourself in, in, the, in, in the time to come. So can you show your uh, wheel of future to us? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll see what I can do about sharing the screen. So let me. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Oh, great! And how does it work? Uh, right. Well, you can see here all the different component parts that I've identified as being really important to at least consider for your work-life balance. So the majority of these factors will apply to most people. I wouldn't say that they all apply to everybody, but I would say the vast majority apply to most people. Uh, so what I've done in workshops is I spin the wheel and there you go, I'm spinning the wheel and you can see the arrow. Uh, so if you can shout out stop, then it'll stop on one of them. And, okay, ambition. Um, so there's a section in the book, there's a section in the book and all these different um, elements, but ambition I put in because that's really important to factor in your work-life balance. Um, I know a lot of people can get very ambitious. They put a lot of time and effort into their work, but sometimes that might be at the cost of your family or your friendships. And it's about calibrating the sense of ambition to make it appropriate for what you're trying to achieve. Um, I remember many years ago, I, I tried to uh, start up an IT um, website. It was just before Facebook came along, and it was something similar. It was about how people can get together and do different activities. And uh, I was really ambitious about that. And I was still counseling and coaching, so I was doing this on the side. But I was working 10, 12-hour days, and I was so ambitious about doing both jobs. And I realized, you know what? I can't do everything. I need to focus on what I am able to do rather than burning myself out. And I wasn't getting a work-life balance. I was just working all the time. So it's the idea of understanding where your ambition is at different stages of your career and how it impacts on your family, how it impacts on your friendships as well. So that's ambition. I can spin the wheel again. So shout and it'll stop. Stop. So mindful, uh, I think we've got here. So this is about being mindful, mindfulness. It's not necessarily the act of having a mindfulness meditation, but it's about living in the moment. It's about being mindful of your experience as you are. So what's going on? And I would like to look at, use your senses about understanding your world in the here and now based on what you see, what you hear, what you touch, what you feel, what you smell. So it's using your senses as a way to really stay mindful. And if you're mindful, it's often a good way to reduce worry because worry is about fearing things in the future um, or you're worried about things in the past. But if you're mindful, you're not worrying. Uh, so it's, it's a good de-stressing element to say, I don't need to worry. Why do I need to worry? I don't, but if I'm mindful, I just live in the moment and I can enjoy what's going on. Yes, there might be challenges, there might be difficulties, but they will pass. I can be mindful, live in the moment. And this is a big part of work-life balance. It's about appreciating where we are rather than getting swamped by worries of the future or the past, which serve no purpose. I'll come out of that. There you go. It looked very interesting. In fact, um... I'm sure uh, we can, uh, we could have gone on and on, but uh, we have to sum up our session as well. So, uh, 
Okay, so um, Rick, uh, tell me one thing. You have tapped the topic of wellness at work much before the vagaries of the pandemic. And today it is one of the hottest topic that concerns us all. How do you feel can people and organizations deal with wellness in the workplace? I think it's, it's about keeping it very high on the agenda. Um, I think, as I said earlier, organizations are very much appreciating that to have a healthy um, workforce is going to be a more productive um, workforce. Um, and I think the books that I've either written or contributed to over the last um, 20 odd years have, have really given me an opportunity because I do enjoy writing. That's another passion that I have. Um, but it's about being able to reach a global audience. And, and I think uh, organizations are going to be prioritizing wellness. Um, we have a lot of global organizations out there and that crosses different cultures. But all the organizations still focus on well-being irrespective of the countries that um, they operate in. Um, but I think wellness is important because if you don't have a healthy workforce, you're not going to have a productive workforce. So it'll stay high on the agenda. Right. So now can you show your book to us, to, to the audience? We've been talking about your book. Uh, I think, you know, the audience would like to see the book as well. Well, you can't miss it. It's, it's a very yellow uh, book. Uh, I saw it on a bookshelf uh, just before um, lockdown, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I can see this from 20 yards away. But there you go. Get alive. Um, creating a successful work-life balance. Great. So I hope our audience can see the book and... Uh, you know, uh, I'll request you to go to koganpage.com and buy this book. It's available there. And uh, this book and Rick can actually help you achieve work-life balance, especially through the nine P's and 45 individual components of variables, which form the wheel of future that we just saw, you know, which uh, Rick just uh, uh, showed it to us. And uh, we provide a link to the book uh, in the description of the video. So just go through it and definitely if you are actually struggling through stress in the workplace or you want to, you know, uh, get your work-life balance sorted out, I'll sincerely recommend you to go and buy the book by Rick, yeah? Okay, so uh, thank you Rick. Thank you so much for coming on Authorize and uh, sharing your ideas, your uh, experiences and your journey with us. It was lovely talking to you today. Thank you once again. Thank you, Ekta. Lovely to speak with you as well. And thank you for your great question. It's, uh, it's been a privilege to be part of Amazing Workplaces. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Rick. It was a pleasure indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel for latest updates on leadership interviews, webinars and educative videos related to human resources, learning and development, culture, employee engagement, and many more.